This is a mess. Okay, let me clean it up. This is negative 30, x to the one third. How do I want to do this? Let me do this on the side. What I'm going to do is this right here on the side. I'm not going to bring the negative sign. I'm just going to do this first. So if I multiply those, I'm doing x to the negative 2 thirds times 10 minus 10x. This marker is no good. <clears throat> Distribute, right? Boom, boom. This marker is no good too x to the, uh, 10x to the negative 2 thirds, and then minus 10x to the what? 1 third, right? Because you're adding exponents. This x has a 1 on it. You add those, you get 1 third there. But then what am I supposed to do with this? Subtract it, right? Subtract it. So it's going to become minus this, and then plus this. And all over 9x to the 2 thirds. Yuck. Any questions there? Why? Why? Yeah. All right, is there anything that can go together here? Aren't these the same? You can combine those together. Those are like terms. So how many of those should I have? Negative 20 of them, right? Negative 20? All right. I'm going to continue over here. So this is equal to, uh, I'll go ahead and write that. Negative 20, oh, that's not a 20. Neg negative 20 x to the 1 -third and then minus 10 x to the negative 2 thirds, and then all of that over 9 x to the 2 thirds. What are y'all thinking about that derivative there? Second derivative, I should say. Looks pretty bad. Pardon me? There's more we can do here. Yeah, there's more. Um, you could take an x and a one third out. It'd be a little bit weird here, but you could. Did you? Did you? Yeah, there's a, there's a completely other way to do this. So we can check it. Did you just do the derivative of the first derivative before we cleaned it up? Yeah. Yeah, that's. I'm going to show it after we do this. Yes. You can move that negative exponent down, yeah. Uh, it can go down, it can't go, this can't go down here unless you deal with that first. Let me, let me do this. Do you all agree so far that's the second derivative? Yes? Okay, let's go ahead and start asking the questions. I want the critical numbers. So you know how what we did before is we took our original function, took its derivative, then we found out where it was zero, where it didn't exist. We're going to do the same thing right now. We're going to figure out where that's zero and figure out where it doesn't exist. It's a fraction, right? Right now it's a fraction? Yeah, so we only take let's, let's go figure out where it's zero. Yeah, I'm only going to look at the, the numerator. So the first thing here is I want to know where does the second derivative equal zero, right? That's the question. So to do that, I take that and I only have to worry about the numerator. Negative 20 x to the 1 third minus 10 x to the negative 2 thirds equals 0. There's a couple of ways to do this, a couple of ways you can approach this. So I'm going to do it this way and if you don't like it, that's okay. There's other ways to do it, but is that correct? Yes. Okay. Can I put those two together with a common denominator? Yes. Yes? How? 
multiply the top and bottom of this one by x, x to the two-thirds here and x to the two-thirds here. Now they would have the same denominator, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. I can put them together. So if I multiply, this is multiplication between these two, right? I'm multiplying. What happens if you take x to the two-thirds times negative 20x to the one-third? Negative 20x is all you get. So this becomes negative 20x and then minus 10, the other numerator, over the common denominator. And I want to know where that's zero, right? So I put these two together into a fraction. Hey, again, I have another fraction equals zero, don't I? So I only have to look at the numerator. numerator. And now you get an answer, finally, somewhere. Do you? What is it? X is? Is it, is it negative or positive? Negative a half. OK, negative a half. Is that in the domain of the original function? Yes, because we said domain was all real numbers, right? I told you, it's algebra, right? It's the algebra, yeah. From here to here? This is a fraction, right? A fraction can only be zero when? When the top is zero, right? Now, I do need to address the fact that this could be undefined, right? Where's the second derivative not exist? Look at the second derivative. Can you just look at it? Zero, right? X is zero. X is zero. If I try and plug zero into that, I have a problem, don't I? And of course, zero's in the domain because the domain is all real numbers. So we have two critical numbers, don't we? Mm -hmm. And we're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to draw a number line. We're going to break up our number line to sections. We're going to pick test points. And where do you think we're going to plug those test points into? Into the second derivative, right? Into the second derivative. And that's going to suck because we never wrote the second. Well, we did. We wrote it down right here, didn't we? That was our, let me just circle that. That was our second derivative right here. Still pretty ugly, but that's it. Let's draw the number line. So if I draw a number line, put my two points, make sure they're in order, make sure they're in order, negative one half and zero. And then pick some test points. Negative one? Mm. Negative one fourth? Would work, right? One. And those are going to get plugged into the second derivative. And what I'm looking for is whether or not I'm going to get a positive or a negative. Bless you. What happens, what happens if the second derivative is positive? What does it tell us about the original function? It's concave up. What if the second derivative is negative? What does it tell us about the original function? Concave down, right? So do you all see this is like the same procedure? except that we're doing it on the second derivative, and the conclusion's different. It's not up, down, it's concave up, concave down. Why do you have to use the same derivative? Why do you have to you have do it? To find it. That's a very good question. Why do we even care, right? I'll give you an example after this. All right, can we test these? Yes. Okay, let's do it. Now, before I test it, I think that some of you might have some trouble plugging those numbers into this, especially because of this negative exponent. So I'm just going to rewrite this real quick so that we're clear on what it means. No, you don't have to show it. You can, you can do it. You can do it in your calculator. But just you know, do it right. Yeah. Do y'all agree this is the same thing? Yes. Let's plug in one first, because one's going to be the easiest one out of all these, right? Let's plug in one into this. What would happen if I plug one in here? 
You have one and then times that, negative 20. So let me put it here. I'm testing, I'm testing x equals one first, all right? So I get negative 20 and then minus what? 10 over one, which is 10. And then all of that over nine times one. Is that answer positive or negative? It's negative, right? Negative 30 over nine. So this is a negative number, which means right here, my second derivative is negative. Negative people frown, right? So that means the original function is concave down here. Then let's plug in negative one, because those are gonna be the easy, I mean, this can be easier than the fraction. So if I plug in negative one, Okay, what happens if you take the cube root of negative one? Cube root of negative one is what? Negative one, so negative one times 20, and negative 20 is 20 this time. Okay, down here, be careful. Be careful, because you're doing negative one squared, right? Which is one, and the cube root of one is one. So this is still gonna be one, right? And so minus 10. And then over, and then nothing changes here, right? Because of the squared, it's gonna be negative one squared, it's one, cube root one is one, so you're just gonna get nine down there? That answer is positive, isn't it? So this one was negative, this one was positive, and that was this one right here, right? The second derivative was positive, which means the original function's happy, it's concave up. Yes? No. What do you mean? This? Yes. No, you need to just somehow be able to tell me where it's concave up and down. All right, now we got to plug in point, point, negative 0.25, right? That one's going to suck. That one might require a calculator for, all right? Um, I can do it without, without a calculator, though. Just seems like it would be more work to simplified at this point. Um, why don't y'all try and plug, y'all try and see if you can plug that into your calculator and get an answer. While you're doing that, I'm going to get Desmos ready to graph this for us. I'll leave that up there. It was five, four. It needs to be a cube root, not a square root. I can help you in a minute. All right, okay. if you're having trouble plugging that number in, we can worry about that later. You should get a negative answer. I'm not gonna show it, I'm not gonna go through it. I, the second derivative here is negative, which means we're concave down. So how do you put that all together though? From the first and second? Are we gonna have to put, let me draw? No, not yet. We haven't talked about that yet. Okay. Yeah, okay, y'all good? No. Any questions, come on. Anybody? All right, can you tell me where it's concave up? Yes. Where? Uh, infinity, uh, negative infinity uh, to uh, negative one half. I'm gonna just squeeze that in here. From negative infinity to negative one half. Where is it concave down? Uh, negative one half to Forever, right? Because it stays negative the whole time. So from negative one half to infinity. Oh, and so the inflection point would be where it goes. Anywhere you have a change in concavity. We have a change in concavity here, don't we? Yeah. Goes from concave up to concave down. That's an inflection point. Oh. Okay, so x equals negative a half is our inflection point. Do you have to find the y? I don't require you to find the y. Wait, what's the inflection point 
Our inflection point is anywhere you have a change in concavity. Okay. We went from concave up to concave down. If you go from concave down to concave up, that's an inflection point. So on the well, hold on. Yes? That is it. What's that? From negative infinity to negative one half doesn't look like it's going down. Going down? Or is it concave down? Okay, well let's let's analyze it all now. Okay, let's take a look. Here's the graph. Y'all see this graph? I've typed it into the computer. There it is. So let's go to this first information that we had. Parts one, two, and three. Where were we saying we were going up? Zero to one. Zero to one. Do you all agree on this graph? From zero to one, we are increasing. Yes. yes? Okay, where do we say we're going down? From negative, infinity. negative infinity to zero. So do you all agree we're coming down here? Yeah. Okay, do you agree from one on we're going down? Yes. Did we say we had a local minimum? Yes. Where? Three. Uh, no, hold on. At zero, right? At zero, we had a local minimum? Yeah. And when the local max was at one. Do you all see everything is matching this? Local min, local max. Our decreasing intervals and our increasing intervals all match up, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes? For the inflection point, you don't like the Yeah, the, the, just the x is fine. If you want to give me the y, it's fine. All right, so are you all okay with this matches our graph? Yes. yes. Okay, now let's look at this. Where is this function concave up? Where does it look like a smile? Well, it's hard to see on this graph, isn't it? It doesn't ever look like a smile, does it? But according to us, it should be from negative infinity to negative one half. Here's negative one half, right? Here's negative one half. Right there to the left of that should look like a smile. It's hard to tell that's a smile, isn't it? But it is. One, one thing I could do is maybe change this scale. It might help us see it. I'm not sure yet. Let's see. I don't think that helped. Yeah. Does that help or no? From here to the left is part, of a is part of a smile. It's hard to see it, right? But it is part of a smile. If you don't believe so, then the calculus is what should tell you that's what's happening, all right? You're a concave up over there. Now, where are we concave down? To the right of one half. So, so do you all agree that this looks like it's concave down, kind of? Like a frown? I'm kind of exaggerating it now. That's kind of frowning there. And then isn't this all frown? It's all part of frown. Right? Does that address your question? Or did you? Yes? Yes, sir? What about at zero? What about at zero? Where the second derivative wouldn't exist, how would that be concave down? Well, when we, so this goes back to what we talked about when you talk about concave up, concave down, increasing and decreasing. When you talk about an, a function increasing, let's just go with increasing because it's easier. The only way you can actually talk about increasing is if you're looking at two distinct points. So if you go, let's say from left to right, if I go from here to here on a graph, do you agree I've increased? And if I go the other way from here to here, I've decreased. But if I just put that point there and I ask you, am I increasing or decreasing there? It doesn't make sense. Because to talk about increasing or decreasing, you have to have a second point to compare it to. Make sense? Same thing with concavity. To talk about concavity, you need more than one point. So um, we're not concerned that uh, what's happening at zero because you actually have, have to look at the points next to it to talk about the concavity. So if you look at zero a little bit to the right, it's concave down. A little bit to the left, it's concave down. Does that address your question? Yes. Okay. All right. We've answered everything. That only took us uh, about an hour, 50 minutes or so to do that. These problems are extremely long and tedious. And so I was asked here a second ago, a couple of minutes ago, like why do we need to do the concavity, right? So I'll give you an example of why concavity is important, all right? Are we eventually going to have to put 
all of the things that we put in the graph? We're going to talk about that. Hang tight. All right, so I want, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an example. Of, let's say this is a company, all right? And here we have time. And here, let's say we have our profit, okay? Or money, whatever, however you want to look at it. Revenue, profit, whatever. Just we're looking at our money, all right? And let's say we have this happening. We, st we started our company, right? And we started to make money. Good, right? That's good, yes? Money coming in is growing over time, yes? All right, but as a calculus student perspective, what would be the interesting point on that graph for me? Where it changes from concave up to concave down. So do you see here it looks like a smile? And then somewhere in here, it starts to look like a frown, yes? That point is an inflection point, right? So the first derivative, you would say this is always increasing, right? Always increasing. Um, but even though it's always increasing, there's a change in concavity here. And that, that actually is important to me in terms of a business because I know who to fire, yeah. So think about, the, look at the tangent line right now, not concavity, just the tangent line. Tell me what's happening, positive or negative? Positive. Okay, positive, is it getting steeper or not? Yes. Steeper, right? Steeper means higher rate of growth. I'm making money, right, faster and faster. But then I get to this point and what starts to happen? Now it's still positive, still positive tangent line, right? But it's, but it's not as steep, right? So our profit is growing but not as fast as it was before. Something happened right here where our profit started, the, the, the growth in our profit started to decrease. That makes sense? Anyone know what that's called, that point? point? It's an inflection point, but in like more of a business economics, no? It's called the point of diminishing return. The point of diminishing return. It's an important point in, in a bit from a business perspective because this point, you would say, hey, who did we hire, right? Who did we hire? What happened? Something, we did something different, right? Something changed, and now we're not making money as fast as we were making money before, right? So the inflection point is important for those sorts. I don't know if that's even at addressing your question. Who asked the question? You asked the question? Now, there's a bigger question we have to address here, which is why go through an hour of work when I just went to Desmos and typed it in? We had all that, right? And it was very, very quick, right? And there's a good argument to be made that we don't need to do all of this, right? That some, at some point, we can use the technology. And I agree, we can't depend on it, but we can use it. The next section that we're supposed to cover right now is a section that most students in calculus dread if they've heard of it or seen it. And that is we're supposed to put everything together now everything we learned in college algebra, pre-cal, everything together, and use the calculus to draw a function by hand very precisely. Because before computers, before technology, before Desmos, if I wanted to graph a function accurately, I would need to know all this increase, decrease, concave up, concave down to draw an accurate picture. But the thing is, we do have technology. So for us, from my, in my opinion, what's most important to us is to figure out these things. Then yes, go use the technology to draw it for you. But do you remember how we had um, that negative one half where it didn't look like it went from a smile to a frown? On the graph, it didn't look that way. We know it's there, right? We know that it's there because of the math. So what I've opted to do in, a, in my Cal 1 classes is to not spend the tremendous amount of time and effort required to graph things by hand. What we will do is we will just focus on these questions, all right? All right. <clears throat> We're gonna do another example, all right? We're gonna do another example. But before I do it, I wanna tell y'all a quick little story that has to do with this. This is a true story. So I remember when I first uh, finished school, grad school, I worked with this guy. We were both graduate students. And uh, 
we worked in this little cubit, these cubicles together as TAs. And we, I mean, we we're kind of math dorky, you know, it's just being in the math, it's just kind of inherent that you're a little bit math dorky. So it was during about Valentine's Day, and he was saying to me, you know, I was asking, what are you going to do with your, I think it was his wife, he was married. He said, you know, what are you and your wife going to do for Valentine's Day, blah, blah, blah. He's like, I don't know, but he goes, what do you think about this? And this is serious, he told me this. He said, I'm going to tell her that if, if, you take the function L of T, which this function represents his love for her, <laughs> right, as a function of time. I guess she was kind of a math person too. I think she was. Okay, so he was saying what he was going to tell her for, for Valentine's Day is that if L of T is, is the function that shows, that, that graphs his love for her over time, he was going to tell her to try and like flatter her that L prime of T was always greater than zero for all T. Aww. Aww. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> uh, not, it could be zero. What does the derivative tell you? The slope of the tangent line. But what have we been doing? I mean, we just did these intervals. What, is it, what does L prime tell you about L? It's always growing, right? Doesn't this, tell you, doesn't this say that if you were to graph the love function, right? If you were to graph this function as a function of time, that it must always be going what? Positive. Increasing, right? Always increasing. That's, that's very flattering, isn't it? Oh. Right? Isn't that flattering? And I told him, you better not tell her that. Hmm? No, because there's something wrong with this. Is that enough? Is there something even better than this that would be even more impressive about his love? What do you got? Yeah, the second derivative is positive as well. Why is that even better? Because watch this, watch. What if I draw a horizontal asymptote? Is it possible to have a function go up to that asymptote, continue getting closer and closer to it without ever touching it? And wouldn't it always be increasing? Right? So isn't this an example of this right here? Yes? But that love is bounded. Do you see that? That love is bounded. There's a boundary on it. But that's concave down, right? That graph is always concave down. So the second derivative of this is always negative. By forcing the second derivative to be positive, you have to be concave up, which makes a horizontal asymptote impossible. You would have to concave up at some point, and now it grows without bound. So this is even better. This is like. See, this was almost like he was lying to her. He wound up, true story, I'll mute myself. What? So, oh. he, uh, he uh, when he said that, I was like, you know, this is actually kind of true, you know, because <laughs> there is a bound on, I guess, that love. But, the second derivative being there, like that, forces that thing up. Do you all see that? I'm only telling you that story because it helps, I think, understand how the second derivative kind of impacts the shape of the graph as well. Just because you say something is always increasing does not mean it grows without bound. You can have a horizontal asymptote, get closer and closer to it, and keep growing. You're growing, getting closer and closer. You never touch it, right? Okay. True story. You ready to do another example or not? Hey, look, these problems take a while. I cannot do an example and just send you to your homework. We can do that as well. Do y'all want to do one more or not? I'm happy to move on. Yes. Let's take a vote. Show of hands. How many of you want to see one more? Okay.
same, same instructions as the one we just did. f of x equals x plus cosine x. All right, we haven't done a trig one yet, have we? We haven't done a trig. I want the same six things. Where is this going up? Where is it going down? Where is it um, got a local max, local min? Where is it concave up? Where is it concave down? And tell me where it has any inflection points. All right? So I'll do that in a little shorter notation. First question, right, where is F going up? Second question, where is F going down? Third question, local max min. Fourth question, where is it concave up? Fifth question, where is it concave down? And the last question is inflection points. I'm just going to put IP for inflection points. Is that all right? What, just by looking at this, what's the good news? There's good news. The derivatives are pretty simple, right? The first and second derivatives are going to be very easy on this compared to the last problem, right? So let's just knock those out right now. Let's just get the derivatives. What's the first derivative of this? One minus sine x, right? And then what's the second derivative? Negative cosine x. Boom, man, that was a lot easier than those derivatives we just did, right? I've got them all written down now. All right, let's do the first part. First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to find the critical numbers, right? I need to know where the derivative, first derivative is 0. Right? Let me do it right here. I'm trying to find the critical numbers, right? So where's the first derivative equal to 0? Well, that means I want to know where 1 minus sine x is 0, right? And if I move things around, that's saying where does 1 equal sine x? And now you're back in pre-cal, and you're asking yourself, at what angles is sine 1? Sine is the y-coordinate on the unit circle. Up here, right? Yeah. Pi over 2. That's only one answer, though. How many are there? Two. No. How many places does your sine function hit the value of 1? Infinitely many places infinitely many places, right? So you have an infinite number of solutions here. Yep, the way we write it in pre-cals, we say something like pi over 2 plus 2 pi k, or 2 pi n, right? Pi over 2 plus 2 pi k. Now this is, I'm giving this problem because there's a trade-off here. You got good derivatives, right? Easy derivatives, but you've got a little bit harder ideas here. We have an infinite number of places where we have 